How's everybody doing today? Like Renee said, today is Baptism Sunday, and I am so excited. It's going to be a really awesome day. Since the start of our church, um, we had tried to do baptisms. It was scheduled to be the weekend that we closed down due to COVID. And so this is actually the very first baptism that we've been able to successfully um, like execute. The water is out there. The people are here. So we are super pumped. And so it is actually part of the service. Once we get through the message, I will instruct you guys on how we're going to head back out that way. Um, and the friends that we have that are getting baptized are going to get baptized, and we are going to celebrate with them because it's an awesome step in their faith journey. I am just pulling up my message because when I opened my iPad transparently, it was on ABC Mouse because I have a three-year-old and she was playing with it in the car. So um, I don't know if I got the chance to say my name is Erin. I am the co-pastor here at Local and I'm super excited to be with you guys. We are starting a new series called Family Values. And I wanted to start off today with a question which is super fitting for the weather. Who here loves the beach? Like, I love the beach, but who here also loves the beach but wishes that the sand would stay at the beach, right? Like, can I get, like, double hands up for that? Since we have little kids now, um, I just find sand in places that you never knew that sand could be. And sand is like nature's glitter. Like, it doesn't ever go away, and it is going to be with you forever. (laughs) So... And sand haunts me, but I still do love the beach. And when I was growing up, my very favorite part of the summer was when my family would take our annual trip to York Beach, Maine. So my family is originally from Connecticut, and so we would take this super long road trip all the way from Virginia Beach. We would stop in Connecticut. We would gather the rest of the aunts, uncles, cousins, grandparents, and we would all head up to York Beach, Maine, which is um, one of the most beautiful places that I've ever been. And it was this awesome family value that we had to spend that time together, and we did it every single summer, um, and we still do it, and I get to bring my kids, and that's something that I absolutely love. And when I was a little kid, my favorite thing to do when we were in Maine was to go boogie boarding. As an adult, I seriously question why, because I don't know if you guys have been to New England in the summer, but the water on a good day is still only like 55 degrees. (laughs) So like, let that sink in, and here's me with my little eight-year-old self and all of my cousins, and we are out in the water. We are just numb. There's some hypothermia setting in, and we are feeling super cool with, like, our foam boogie boards with, like, the awesome dolphin design, you know, like whoever had the coolest one. Um, and so we were out there, and we would be in the waves, and we would be out there, honestly, for, like, hours. And we would be swimming and playing. And I don't know if you guys have ever had this experience when you're playing in the water, and all of a sudden you look up, and you don't see your family's, like, place on the beach anymore, right? Because as we're playing and we're enjoying ourselves, the current has taken us, and we have been pushed to the side, and the current and the waves have pushed us away from where we wanted to be. And I think life and culture can cause us to drift, right? Life and culture can come in, and it can cause us to drift, and we can look up in the middle of our lives and think, man, this isn't where I wanted to be. This isn't where I had hoped to be. And we can get so caught up in our everyday that we don't realize that the current of culture is pushing us into values that we don't want to have. And then all of a sudden, we look up and these marriages, you know, there are marriages isn't as fulfilling as we hoped it would be. Maybe understanding your kids isn't as easy as you thought it would be before you had kids. Maybe your relationship with God has become stale. And just like playing in the ocean, we can drift. But I remember when I was a kid and I noticed that I had drifted too far, I would always look up and I would see my mom or my dad or my aunt Karen and she would be waving at us and telling us to come back to where she was. And I would follow the sound of their voice and I would paddle as hard as I could to get back to where I knew that I wanted to be. And guys, I'm here to tell you this morning that God is calling us back towards him today. And we are going to talk about how we get back to where God wants us to be because he's calling us home. And you see, God wants great things for your family. He wants your family to be a unit that's filled with, with peace and support, with true, unconditional love, a team that works together. And I'm telling you this, that during this series, we're going to learn how to hear God's voice calling us back to the values that he has for us. And today we're going to kick off our series, Family Values. And in the the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about um, the values that God has for our families instead of what our culture says it should be. So if you are married, if you are single, if you are divorced, if you are a student, if you are retired, this series is for you. 
If you have a family right now, it's for your current family, but it's also for your future family. If you are dreaming about a family, and it's for your church family because we are all in relationship together. So we're going to talk about marriages. We're going to talk about how to build a lasting family. We're going to talk about how generations can relate to one another. But today, before we get there, we're going to talk about a subject that sets us up for the rest, and it's a tough one, and that is forgiveness. So we're going to start by looking at forgiveness. And the the theme for this series is found in the Psalms. Psalm um, 11, 3 through 4 starts out and it says, if the foundations are destroyed. So maybe your marriage is feeling like it's on rocky soil, right? Maybe your relationship with your kids is not feeling the way you wanted it to be and you're in constant argument. Maybe you have little ones running around and it can be overwhelming at times. Or maybe you're just looking to get started in dating relationships and those haven't worked out the way that you had hoped that they would if the foundations are destroyed. The verse goes on and it says, what can the righteous do? Like, have you guys ever been there in life? You're like, well, what am I supposed to do now? God, like, here I am, like, do I quit? Do I stop? Do I buy a book? Do I ask somebody for advice? Like, what are we supposed to do? And I love where this verse goes because we check the answer. It's natural for us to feel like we should look around and try to solve um, our problems by ourselves, right? But the verse goes on to say, the Lord is in his holy temple. If the foundations are destroyed, what are the righteous to do? The Lord is in his holy temple. But what about the foundations, God? The Lord is in his holy temple. That means God is in control. If your foundations are destroyed, if you're feeling on rocky soil, do not worry because the Lord is in control and he has the power to rebuild. So our main point for this series is, in order for relationships to work, we must let the one who designed them define them. So I want to point out two values today that the enemy tries to tell us is truth, and so we'll call those our false values. And so our false value, number one, is you don't have to love everyone, right? I feel like we've heard that from the world, like, you don't have to love everyone. That's not your job. Now, it's true that you're not going to get along with everyone, and nobody is asking you to do that. We see it throughout the Bible where Jesus actually had a hard time getting along with the religious leaders in his day. But as a Jesus follower, loving people is essential to your spiritual walk. And I'm going to be honest with you guys. Sometimes people drive me crazy, right? People just drive me crazy. If we're all being honest, we all get there. But the most famous Bible verse says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world. And the Greek word for the word world there um, is actually every single person, every single body in the world. And even the people you disagree with, they count inside of that every single person situation. Um, As Jesus followers, we're called to love everyone. And I have some tough news for you today if you are a Jesus follower. Your relationship with God is inseparable to the relationship with the people that God has put in your life. It is inseparable. You cannot have a good relationship while purposefully having a bad relationship with people. The Bible tells us that we are made in the image of God, right? So we are the image bearers of God. And the way that you treat an image bearer is a direct reflection on the creator. So that is God's people, and they are all around us. So you can't have a great marriage without having a great relationship with God. And you can't have a great relationship with God if you have a bad relationship with the people that God has put in your life. And you may be like, dang, Aaron, that's kind of tough. And I know, and it sounds like it, and we're going to talk through how we get there. Let's look at what Jesus says. In John 13, 34 through 35, it says, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, you must also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. He really meant it because he said it three times in that same sentence. But it doesn't say the entire world will know that you are my disciples if you go to local vineyard church every Sunday. It doesn't say that they will know you're my disciples if you read your Bible and you pray at home. No, it says they will know that you are my disciples by the way you love everyone, love one another. And that's not a a value that our world shares, right? Our culture right now has this ability to cancel people, right? We tell you to just write people off if they're not doing what you want them to do, if they've hurt you, we just cancel that and we walk away. 
it is a very Jesus thing to really love people. And I was, as I was writing this and thinking of scenarios in my life where that is challenging, I really wondered, but God, how do I practically love them, right? Because it's not just like complimenting their shoes and like kind of being halfway nice, right? It's not a shallow thing that God is asking us to do. So God got, brought me to that famous wedding verse in 1 Corinthians 13, you know, love is patient, love is kind, And we use it in weddings all the time, but that wasn't the original intended purpose. This is for relationships. So I would encourage you, if you have somebody in mind already as I'm starting to talk through this, that you take that person or that situation and you walk through this verse. And you can do this like all throughout your life and you come back to this verse. And in the Passion Translation specifically, it says, love is large and incredibly patient. Love is gentle and consistently kind to all. It refuses to be jealous when blessings come to someone else. That's hard. Love does not brag about one's achievements nor inflate its own importance. Love does not traffic in shame or disrespect nor selfishly seek its own honor. Love is not easily irritated and it it is not quick to take offense. Love joyfully, that's authentically joyfully, celebrates honesty and finds no delight in what's wrong. Love is a safe place of shelter, for it never stops believing the best for others. Love never takes failure as defeat, for it never gives up. So if there is a situation in your life, or if later on there becomes a situation, I encourage you to take that verse to the Lord and you ask God, Show me where you need me, how you need me to love somebody. Is it in gentleness? Is it in kindness? Is it in having incredibly patient words for them? Or is it being a place of shelter for somebody who's difficult? So imagine if Jesus' followers really loved people like Jesus did. The religious leaders came to Jesus and asked him in Matthew 22, 36 through 39, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And by this, they are asking out of the 400 laws that there are, can you just like give us one? Like, is there one that you're really looking for that we can, like, hone in on? Like, one would be great. And Jesus is like, actually, of course I can do that. So Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and, and the people would have been like, no, 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 we didn't say and, we just, we just wanted one, singular one, no and. And Jesus couldn't do that because they are inseparable. He says the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. So if I ask myself the question, how am I doing with God? I also have to include, how am I doing with the people that God has put in my life, right? So if you want to check your vertical relationship, that's me to God, we also have to check our horizontal relationships, and that's me to the people around you. And I know this is not news to anybody, but people will disappoint you, right? People are going to let you down. People are not going to appreciate or notice some of the things that you do. Even your family, it's going to cause some issues every once in a while. We all get hurt and offended, and the easy option is to just love the people who love me. We're right across from a fire station, so God, we pray for those people and that everything is okay, just in case anybody was wondering that's not in the school. Um, The false value that the world gives us is that it's okay to not love everyone, right? But Jesus, his value is this in Matthew 5, 46 through 47. What reward do you deserve if you only love the lovable? Don't even the tax collectors do that? At the time, the tax collectors were not a great group of people. Um, How are any of you different from others if you limit your kindness only to your friends? Don't even the ungodly do that? And here's the truth. If you get good at limiting your kindness, like that verse says, at limiting your love to only the people that love you or that are doing the things that you want them to do, that will eventually bleed into your family, right? Because eventually your spouse is going to let you down. They're going to disappoint you because they're human and they're imperfect. Eventually your kids are going to drive you crazy. And if you have trained your brain to separate out people that are safe and people that are not safe from who deserves your love, eventually that will bleed into a situation with you and your kids or you and your spouse. And that is what we don't want because Jesus followers, as Jesus followers, we are designed and called to love unconditionally as Jesus does. And the second false value that the enemy tries to convince us of is you don't have to forgive. You don't have to forgive. 
You don't have to forgive that person, right? Now, there's three reasons why we actually buy into that false value, and the first is that we have a wrong understanding of forgiveness. So forgiveness, a lot of us think that in order to forgive that I also have to agree with it. And you don't. You absolutely do not have to agree with it or accept it. Forgiveness is not minimizing the seriousness of someone's offense to you. It's not saying what they did is okay. It's not saying that it's swept under the rug. It's not saying that it's all over and that we can you know, all be friends again. It's not downplaying it. That's important to know about forgiveness because it's not reconciliation, right? So reconciliation is different. Reconciliation is a two-player game where both people have to come to the table with something and, and reconcile the relationship. But forgiveness is a one-player game. Forgiveness is actually more about, um, it's less about my attitude towards that person and it's more about my attitude towards God about that person. My attitude towards God about that person. And it's being able to say to God, God, they hurt me, and they took something from me, and they did this thing to me, and I'm not going to let that pollute my heart. Because that's about you, you and your relationship with God. And it's not forgetting what happened. I want you guys to know that the fact real, for, real forgiveness is remembering what happened and being able to still have the peace of God in your heart. And you can forgive people and remember what happened so that you can put the right boundaries in place. Because unless there's reconciliation from that other person, it's very likely going to happen again. People don't, people don't change without action, right? So it is putting those boundaries in place. But we want to be able to forgive and to be able to hand it over to the Lord so that we don't have to hold on to the weight of bitterness and anger and frustration that weigh us down, right? And another reason I think that we don't forgive is that because we don't think it's fair, right? I just don't want to forgive because I, I just don't think that that was fair, that that happened to me or that that person did that to me. And you are totally right. You are totally right that that action that was done to you was not fair, that that hurt was not fair. It's not okay for somebody to say something about you that is hurtful. It's not okay for somebody to do something to you. It's not okay for somebody to abuse um, any part of their relationship with you. It's not okay. But trust me that you don't want fair. Because if God was a God of just fair, we would have to pay for our own sins. And thank God that Jesus came to live a life that we couldn't and die a death that we deserved and take those from us so that we can walk around light and free. Jesus stepped in and took our punishment on the cross so that we could be forgiven. And check out this story in the Bible that highlights the struggle of forgiveness even with Jesus' closest followers. Peter, in this story, has clearly forgiven someone like a number of times. And so he's coming to Jesus to ask him because this person continues to offend him. And in Matthew 18, 21 through 35, he says, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? And he was being really honest. He was like, God, that's a pretty big number. Like, we're, we're already at like three and like is it up to seven. Like, where am I at with this forgiveness thing? And Jesus is like, I tell you, seven, not seven times, but 77 times. And actually, some scholars believe that Jesus meant seven times 70, which would be 490. And in the context that he was saying it, he meant per day. So that is every three minutes, he wants you to forgive somebody without sleeping at all. It's a lot. But he goes on to say, Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And as he began the settlement... A man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. So now in our economy, that would be roughly worth like about $5 billion. And clearly this man had never done a Dave Ramsey financial peace class. Or he was in some serious debt. And since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. So that's pretty intense. The servant fell on his knees begging um, before him and says, be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. Like he just forgave it all, right? He canceled it, but then check out what happens next. When that servant went out, he found another servant who owed him 100 denarii, which is roughly $10,000, so like not a small amount of money. And he grabbed him and he began to choke him. And he said, pay back what you owe me, he demanded. And his fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me, I will pay you back. Sounds familiar, right? But he refused and instead he went off and the man thrown, had the man thrown in prison until he could pay the debt. 
And when the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and told their master everything that had happened. And the master called the servant in and said, you wicked servant. He said, I canceled all of the debt that was yours because you begged me to. And shouldn't you have had, ser- have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay back all that he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. (sighs) Suck the air out of the room on that one. So that's pretty heavy, right? That's a challenging story. And it's easy to look at the story and say, well, I would forgive if I had been like in that scenario and I had been forgiven that much. And I'm here to tell you guys, we have been forgiven that much. God has forgiven us that much. C.S. Lewis says, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. So if you allow God to do this in your heart today, you will walk out of here lighter and freer than when you came in here and more willing to live out the life that God has designed for you. And a lot of us still have this feeling like, I just, I like the two points, but I still can't do that. Like the first couple were okay, but I'm still feeling like that's not where I'm at because you don't know how bad it hurt, right? You don't know like the details of this offense that was done to me. And to be honest, guys, you're right. I do not know. I do not know how you feel in the pain that you are in. I do not know how you felt in that moment. I don't know. But I want to give you some hope today. In Philippians 4.13, it says, I can do... I can do everything through him who gives me strength. And we've heard that verse before. It's a really encouraging one. But I want you guys to know this verse is not a magic eraser. It's not like you say this thing, you pray it, and you're like, okay, everything's done, right? This is a processing verse. This is where we come to God and we use this verse to remind us as we are walking through the process of forgiveness that God is our strength. And I can do all things, even when those things are really, really hard. And two practical ways that God can be your strength. One is that we have to spend time with God. I encourage you guys to carve out and to spend time with God in your everyday, not just on Sunday, but finding time for Bible reading or prayer um, or journaling or listening to worship music. Because let's be honest, we let all sorts of things run through our mind all week long. Social media, news, your friend's opinion, all of that comes into our life, and that's primarily what we listen to during the weekday. And we wonder why we're so fearful and we're so anxious and we have so much going on, so much heaviness. I encourage you to carve out the space for God to meet you in your Monday through Saturday. Get good at allowing God to come into your heart. And the second practical way for God to be your strength is to be honest and be thankful, both at the same time. God is big enough for your honest feelings about that person. I promise you that he sees you and he knows the pain you're going through and you can say it back to him. You can process it with him but also to be thankful, to cultivate an attitude of thankfulness and to train yourself to look for the things that you are thankful for in that person or in that situation. In 1 Thessalonians 5.18, it says, give thanks in all circumstances, not just the easy ones, not just when it's going good, but in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Because God knows something about thankfulness and gratitude and what it does in transforming our heart, allowing our brains to actually look for those good things. It's not just like this trickery of like positive psychology. Like God designed us to be able to have thankfulness in our heart regularly. He said, this is his will for you. So let's just trust he's the creator so we can trust him in that. So we see these false values that the world gives us. And I want to give us three values that Jesus gave us to love others. And I want us to take those as steps as we fight for our families and as we fight for our preferred futures, what you envision when you look forward. And I'm going to preface this with, you are not always going to feel like it, okay? Like, you are not always going to feel like it, and like, I know that this sucks, but really, action typically comes before the emotion. The action comes before the feeling. But if you do it and you take a step forward, transformation is going to happen in your heart. So Jesus' value number one is to pray for them. And I'm not talking about like, yeah, Lord, give them, give them what they got coming. I know. I know you're about justice, so give them what they got coming. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 43 to 44, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. 
Jesus says to love them and pray for them. And see, when you take a person to God through prayer, you actually start working out that relationship with God. You start taking steps in that. Even if that other person's not involved, this is you and God and this heaviness that's in your heart about them. And Lord, I pray that you bless them really bless them, that you give me opportunities to be kind to them. I pray that you work in their lives. And these prayers, they will start to do a work in them, but they will also start to do a work in you. And we see this in the Psalms, right? If you're reading the Psalms, they always start out with like laments and frustration. And you see people like, God, why do you let the wicked prevail? Why have you hid your face from me? And if you continue to read these poems all the way through, you get to the end and it has turned around where they're like, God, thank you for your faithfulness. God, you are my help in times of trouble. The beginning and the end are very different. And we want to know why? because that is a way that they were processing. They were praying in those moments. And we can look at that and know that God was faithful then and he is faithful now. He is the same today and yesterday. Spending time with God and processing with him is a benefit of being a Jesus follower. And if you're not cashing in on that benefit, you are missing out. Spend time with him. Jesus' value number two is to bless them. And now this is making a commitment to not let a negative word come out of your mouth about that person. It's not indulging in gossip. It's not venting over and over the frustration that you feel about them. And I'm talking, if I'm ever talking about that person in a negative way, you're committed to being either in counseling or processing with a safe person to get to a solution. In Luke 6, 27 through 28, it says, But I tell you who hear me, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. In one of my previous jobs, I started a new position and I started working in a different part of the office that was like a much smaller team, right? So I get there and there's this lady. There's a lady in everybody's office, I'm sure. And she's just challenging and she kind of like sucks the room out of, like the air out of the room with negativity. Um, and she really hated change. And I happened to be that change that day. And so she would literally go about her day in this very small office pretending like I didn't actually exist. Like she would just talk as if I wasn't there. And get this, when she actually did talk to me or acknowledge that I was saying anything, she was like, did you say something, Erica? And I was like, she didn't know where I came from and I was about to give her some words. Um, but I calmed myself down, but no joke, it really went on for like multiple weeks. And I was like, what? wrong with this lady? Like, it did literally absolutely nothing. I never even had a conversation with her yet because I didn't have a chance to. So I had let it go on for a little while, and then she called me Erica like one too many times. So I was like, all right, I'm going to go. I'm going to go to her office, and I'm going to tell her all the things and how ridiculous she sounds like all the things I've been thinking, which was many things at the time. And as I was on my way, <laughs> on my way there, um, I overheard her talking to another coworker about some stuff she was going through. And I was like... Okay, well, that doesn't really like negate all the things you're doing to me for no reason. But you know what? By the time I got to her office to have this conversation, I just said, are you okay? Like, you don't seem like you're doing so great. Are you okay? And she wasn't. And we talked. And the next day, I literally just brought her an encouraging note and a coffee mug filled with chocolate candy. And I signed the note from Erica. <laughs> And believe it or not, she became one of my favorite people in the office. And I became like part counselor, part pastor, part friend. And we had this relationship where I was able to give her a little bit of the feedback that other people were feeling. And she stopped becoming such a prickly person. And she actually started to make friends. And like to this day, I still, you know, catch up with her. And, and she loves on my kids and sends them gifts sometimes. And we have this like funny relationship that was literally birthed out of the strangest experience. And I was so irritated when I first met her. And I'm not telling you this because I think that everyone in your life that you dislike or is mean to you is going to automatically become your friend just because God, you know, God makes a way. But what I am telling you is that you have no idea what work God is doing in another person's life. And all God is asking you to do is to listen to his Holy Spirit. That was the Holy Spirit telling me that what I was going to say wasn't what I needed to say, and I just needed to ask her if she was okay. And responding to that opened up this relationship and it blessed me and it blessed her in ways that I would have never seen coming. 
So again, not always going to happen that way, but there are things in our lives that God has placed there for either you to bless somebody or for somebody to bless you, and we just have to be obedient. So God says to bless them, right? We're supposed to pray for them and bless them. And the Jesus value number three is to do good to them. So Romans 12, 17 through 21 says, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay. The Lord says, says the Lord, on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. And some of you are like, yes, like burn, baby, burn. Like that's what we are going for, right? So I was really interested when I, when I read about this verse and really looked into it that it doesn't really work in the culture that we have today. And it's not what, it doesn't mean what you think it means. So back in that day, fire was super important. Obviously, they didn't have stoves or ovens. So if you had been out working all day and your fire had gone out at home, when you came home, like there was no food. There was no way to get that restarted. So it's customary for your neighbor to actually come over and bring you some hot coals from their house to get your fire started. So what God is actually saying in that verse is that thing that he's asking you to do, to do good to that person that's, that's not doing good for you right now, it's going to ignite something for them. It's going to start a fire that God is working on. You may never see it. You may get to see it. You may not. But God is at work. And by doing that, you are heaping burning coals onto that thing that God is already doing. So do not overcome evil with evil, but overcome evil by doing good. And that's countercultural, right? It's not our natural response. And the Apostle Paul tells us in Ephesians to get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander among any and along with every forms of every form of malice. Sorry. <laughs> because honestly, what does all that stuff do for you? Does it help you sleep better at night? Did it make you feel any better when you were talking about them? Maybe for a second, but not in the long term, right? Get rid of it. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ forgave you. Just as in Christ, God forgave you. And that is the most important thing. Because ultimately, guys, if we take one thing away from this, when we truly know that we've been forgiven, it becomes easier to forgive. The forgiven forgive. And that's what we are. We are forgiven. So God empowers us to forgive. So if you bow your heads with me, I will close us in prayer. God, we thank you so much for this morning, Lord, and for your words. Um, yeah, God, so many verses there about loving one another and having this um, supernatural ability to tap into forgiveness. And God, so I pray that wherever people are today, whoever you have laid on their heart in their situation that only you know about, God, I pray that you would continue to work on that as we leave this place and we go into our, into our Monday through Friday, God, that you would continue to speak in that place of forgiveness, of love that is difficult to dish out. And if I was talking today and you may be like, Aaron, that's, that was really good, but I don't have a relationship with that God that you talk about. The good news is, is that it is this easy. You can pray this prayer with me right where you are, just in your seats. That's just between you and God. And you just say, God, forgive me for my mistakes. Make me new. Today I trust in you. Today I believe that you are my Savior and I have been forgiven. Make me new today, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.